Good morning. Welcome to worship with First Christian Church in Bartlesville. We are glad to welcome Michael back again today with us. I understand Jan has made it back safely, and uh, she'll be with us, with us in worship again on, on Sunday next week. Um, she's been up visiting with her parents, and they have transitioned to um, and a, a rehab, skilled nursing, assisted living facility while he is on the mend. So we praise for that. Um, family and friends of Philip Culbertson wanted to let you all know that he passed away on, um, on Saturday. Rita, had, uh, Rita Barnes let me know about that. I don't have any details except for that, but... I, I was. Um, I had to Google him and take a look at at who he was and his scholar and writer and theologian and Episcopal priest. Quite quite a legacy for this congregation and for the Culbertson family. I'll let you know as I as I hear anything else. Um, and just also wanted to let you know about Cindy and Kevin Bennett. They are members at Disciples Christian. And apparently their home burned. And so we need to, to keep them in our prayers and, and I'll, I'll keep an eye out for ways that, that we can help with, with their needs. If you're worshiping today online with us, I invite you to gather something to eat and to drink for communion later on in the service. And I encourage you also to fill out the contact card. There's a space for prayer concerns that you can, can leave on that. Following worship, we have a transition team meeting. This is our second meeting, and we'll be in the library. Um, so if you're on that team, I appreciate your time and your energy. We have a regular meetings next um, on Monday. We have prayer group at 1 o'clock, and we've got Bible study tomorrow at 2, continuing Luke. Also want to remind everyone that we uh, are collecting deodorant and Jiffy cornbread mix for the Concern Pantry this month for February. Um, and it was just pointed out to me by some eagle-eyed proofers that there, uh, there is a worship service that has been left off of the schedule. So wanted to let you know that we are indeed going to be worshiping next Sunday. There is no hiatus. Sunday happens every week. <laughs> so we will, there will be a worship service. Are there other announcements? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please rise for our call to worship and our hymn of praise. Please join me in the call to worship. Called by God, we have come to worship. Called by Christ, we have come to follow. Called by the Spirit, we have come to rejoice. Called together, we will listen and pray.
this is our time of prayer, I hope you'll take a few moments to think about your blessings, all the things that you have cherished this week, and also to have courage, share, share with us the things that you have on your heart. Of course, today we keep Jan's parents, Charlie and Esther, in our prayers as they transition. God in your mercy. Also, the family and friends of, of Philip Culbertson, God in your mercy. We also want to lift up Cindy and Kevin Bennett for their house fire. God in your mercy. Are there others? Yes, Sarah. She's here. Oh, it's a boy. Oh, goodness. Okay. So we have a, you said great, great, two greats. Wow. So welcome the boy to the family. God in your mercy. The others. Oh, yes, Suzanne. Wow. Suzanne's nephew, Carrie, he is a real success story, and I know he's been covered in prayer uh, for, for several weeks now, actually several months now, I think. Pray for the continued recovery. God, in your mercy. Will you bow with me? God, you reach out to us calling us to be partners in service to your work in this world, and we are humbled. Who are we that you should call us? There are days when we know that we can do more, and days when we know that we can do better, and days when we can't really comprehend how you love us and work through us, but in your grace and your mercy, you do. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for challenging us to be more faithful and Christ-like. Teach us to seek you, to see you in our neighbors, and to be about your work in the world. We ask these things through Christ Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
just a note in your bulletin, we uh, found that out that Jan was not going to be with us again this week after we had already printed the bulletin. There is no choir anthem today. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that it has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the Lord, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes or listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part of it remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. May God add blessing to the reading of this word. Have you heard the expression, this is not what I signed up for? Or, I didn't sign up for this. It's a very versatile phrase, and I think it's applicable in a variety of contexts. Maybe the economy takes a nosedive, and suddenly, in addition to being a supervisor, you're all also working on the floor as well. Maybe a pandemic slips into your world, and now you're wearing masks in worship to protect your neighbors. And those masks are hot and stuffy and make it more difficult to sing. Maybe you've been a church member for all of your 70-plus years, And now you and a handful of the faithful are faced with the task of closing the church. There's so much to do, so much more than anyone could have imagined. Maybe this is just the latest in a whole series of disappointments. There was the much-anticipated joining of two congregations that never materialized. The exodus of young families when a ministry ended times when another member acted in thoughtlessness or in unkindness, or when the church leadership took a path that you just couldn't comprehend or understand. You've told me the stories, and all of them beg for that conclusion. This is not what we signed up for. Isaiah found himself saying, woe is me, and how long, when he heard what his job as a prophet to Israel was going to entail, he clearly had his hand raised, ooh, pick me, pick me, before he knew what the assignment was. Theologian Frederick Buechner has written a great deal about the idea of vocation, doing our life's work. He defines vocation as the place where your deep gladness 
and the world's deep hunger meet. Where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. That sweet spot is what we call vocation. After hearing that God expected Isaiah to do exactly the opposite of what a prophet usually does, Isaiah surely did not feel deep gladness, nor did he see himself helping a deep need that the people had. He must have seen quite the opposite of true vocation. Now, this is a retelling of Isaiah's story by that same theologian, Frederick Buechner, that I believe can add to our understanding of the scripture. In this that I'm going to read, Buechner refers to God as the mystery. There were banks of candles flickering in the distance and clouds of incense thickening the air with holiness and stinging his eyes. And high above him, as if it had always been there, but was only now seen for what it was, like a face in the leaves of a tree or a bear among the stars, there was the mystery itself, whose gown was the incense and the candles a dusting of fold of, at the hem. There were winged creatures shouting back and forth the way excited children shout to each other when dusk calls them home. And the whole vast reeking place started to shake beneath his feet like a wagon going over cobbles. And he cried out, oh God, I am done for. I am foul of mouth and I am a member of a foul-mouthed race. With my own two eyes, I have seen him. I'm a goner and sunk. Then one of the winged things touched his mouth with fire and said, there, it will be all right now. And the mystery itself said, who will it be? And with charred lips, he said, me. And mystery said, go. Mystery said, go give the death hell till you're blue in the face and show the blind heaven till you drop in their tracks because they'd sooner eat ground glass than swallow the bitter pill that puts roses in the cheeks and a gleam in the eye. Go do it. Isaiah said, do it till when? Mystery said, till hell freezes over. Mystery said, do it until the cows come home. And that is what a prophet does for a living. And starting from the year that King Uzziah died, when he saw and heard all those things, Isaiah went and did it. The differences between the scripture and Beekner's reimagining are subtle, but helpful, I think, in our understanding. Now, so often as is suggested in the lectionary for this week, Sermons may end after the first eight verses of this, where it says, here I am, send me. It's an uplifting, hopeful note. But we need to hear the entirety of this story. The part where Isaiah is asked by God to do something difficult and counterintuitive and unimaginable. And the part where Isaiah hesitates and says, wait, what? How long? And we especially need to see that Isaiah follows through anyway, fueled by a grand vision that reminded him that God is God and he is not. When I was anticipating the move to Texas to serve a church, I was kind of excited about the possibilities for Chris and me to travel and see more of that state. I wanted to go so many places, like San Antonio, Houston, Corpus Christi, so many opportunities for day trips, I thought. Well, I quickly changed my mind, though, when I found out that Austin was the closest at three and a half hours away, Houston was five and a half hours away, and Corpus Christi was six hours away. Texas is truly a whole other country, as their travel posters say. And this is what happens when we judge things based on our own limited perspectives. British theologian N.T. Wright had similar experiences when his family from Europe would come and visit him when he was living in Canada. So Dr. Wright brought out a map of Canada which had an inset labeled England at same scale. So you have Canada and Great Britain. 
helpful visual. That way the visitors could see the whole of England and how it, me how it measured up, how it was smaller than almost every single province in Canada. The vastness of Canada dwarfs Great Britain. And you can see that when you put them side to side for comparison. Wright went on to say what would happen if we were in the sanctuary when someone suddenly showed us God on the same scale? What if someone could flip up half of the roof the way that a child's dollhouse can be lifted up so we could glimpse God in all of the glory, high and lifted up? Such a vision would surely unmake us, rattle us, and make us small and puny and tawdry after all. That was Isaiah's reaction. Dr. Wright says. You see, Isaiah's story isn't about Isaiah, and it isn't about us. It's about God. It's about the transcendence of God, the vastness and the immenseness of God. From our own perspective, God's call can seem strange, impossible, even hard, even absurd. We're not seeing things on the same scale as God in the same way. Whoever thought that as members of this congregation, we'd say yes to a call to end a ministry. Oh, you did push back and do your level best to turn things around so that we wouldn't have to answer that call. It's a call that was investigated and debated and questioned. And it's a call that if we're honest, we're probably still questioning at times. And yet, here we are. Do you remember the way that this passage from Isaiah ended? Devastation. Everything burned and destroyed, except for a stump. Verse 13 says, And even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Even in the end, there is the holy seed. There is still something. There, there is holy possibility. And that's where we are today as a first Christian. Even as we dismantle and dispatch and dispose, the holy seed of our legacy remains in food for the hungry, in shelter for the homeless, and maybe even in increased economic stability for the community, in ministries strengthened, in Christian witnesses broadened. We can't truly see from our perspective what that legacy is going to become, what that seed is going to become. Like Isaiah, we answered a call at our baptisms that we didn't fully understand. But we realize, like Isaiah, that God can produce so much more than we could ever imagine from the tiniest of seeds, from a small lump of leaven, and from a small, tiny mustard seed. There's so much more. And so we press on in hope. Amen. As we gather around the table today, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different. At one point, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm warning you ahead of time so that, so that it doesn't surprise you. Sometimes the greatest offering that we give involves letting go of anger or fear or resentment that we have. It gnaws away at us. It can harden our hearts. It can snap our minds shut like steel traps. As we navigate this season of life as a congregation, one of our tasks is to offer forgiveness in our hearts to those that we have blamed along the way. This forgiveness should even extend to yourselves, maybe especially to yourselves because you're worthy of your own forgiveness. So take a moment and close your eyes. Consider one person, one group, 
one event, something that you need to release in forgiveness. And ask God to help you take this first step. You may open your eyes. No matter what you put in the offering plate this week, what you just did, what you just offered to God is worth much more than that, so much greater. Please rise as we give thanks to God. be seated. This table is our, probably our best experience of forgiveness. When we come and we confess, we own up to the things that we may not have done as well as we could have or should have in this past week over the course of our lives. And God meets us, Jesus meets us here at this table with grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and kindness, perhaps even more kindness than we have for our own selves. So I invite you now to partake of this feast, having come straight from confession. Accept God's blessing. Shall we pray? Gracious and loving God, we gather at this communion table in remembrance of your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ. Help us to be mindful of his teachings as we strive to be his witnesses in our community. Open our eyes to the needs of others. Give us the courage to act and the words to say when we do not know what to do or to say. Help us to accept and forgive others as he accepts them freely. Amen. Amen.
On the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room, consoling his friends, explaining to them what was happening, much to their disbelief, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he shared it with them. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, Jesus took a cup and he poured it. He shared it with his friends. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me until I come again. The table is set. Partake in love and joy and in grace. So you may look at this hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth, and say, well, that's kind of an odd hymn to end the service on. Why'd you pick that? 
you know what? I think with this scripture, where we're talking about the power of God and the idea that God thought this, you know, God is so great and so vast. What better way to remind ourselves than to look at the beauty in our families, the beauty of the earth and everything around us? I invite you now to stand as we sing our final hymn. You are loved, children of God. You are blessed. Go with the sunshine on your face, the light of God in your hearts. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>